Welcome to the lecture on functional programming. Before I tell you about the organizational issues and details, let me first give you a brief uh, introduction to functional programming so that you have an idea what this lecture is about. I have to manage this microphone. Okay, so that you have an idea what this lecture is about, and then I will. Some mobile phone is entertaining. Okay, so then you have an idea what the lecture is about, and uh, afterwards I'll tell you something about the contents. <laughs> okay, as soon as the music stops. Yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe you <laughs> if, if, if you put it deep down into your backpack. Okay. Okay, so um, what is the lecture about? So in principle, there are two big families of programming languages, namely uh, the imperative languages versus the declarative programming languages. And well, imperative languages, these are the languages that, are, that you are probably most used to. And examples are languages like C, Java, and uh, whatever. And declarative languages, well, there are two big groups of declarative languages, namely functional and logic programming languages. And well, the, the essential idea is that uh, these languages should be much nearer to natural language than to machine language. So this should be somewhat near to the way that humans communicate. And, and the essential idea is that you as a programmer, you don't tell the computer how to solve the problem, but you just declare what the problem is. And then the computer has to solve the problem on its own. So the idea is uh, the program should only describe what the problem is. So what one has to solve. So what the problem is and not not how to solve it. So how to solve it, that's something that the computer should uh, find out on its own. And of course, well, that's the ideal idea. We will see later on that you can influence the way that computations, uh, in fact, uh, are uh, organized. But, but still, that's, that's the essential idea. It should be much nearer to uh, the description of the problem and to human natural language. And to give you an idea, Let's uh, try to illustrate this with one simple example. Namely, let's look at one algorithm and let's program it in an imperative way and let's program it in a de declarative way. And of course, in this lecture, we will look at functional programming, not at logic programming. So let's look at a length algorithm. And well, we will look at it in Java, so in an imperative way. So in Java, that's the imperative implementation of the algorithm. And uh, in Haskell. And Haskell is one of the functional programming languages, and that's the language that we will uh, consider in this course. So in Java and in Haskell. OK, so after some reorganization, um, OK, so to illustrate what functional programming is, let's look at the length program in Java, and let's look at the length program in, in Haskell in a functional language. So how would we solve the problem in Java? So the idea is we have a list, a linear list, and the goal is to compute its length. And in Java, we could do it like this. We could have two classes, a class element and a class list. Now, if you don't know Java, don't worry. This is the only time that Java occurs in this lecture, so it will not occur again. So if you don't understand this, never mind. But if you understand it, uh, it's even better. So we have a class list, and list has one field called element, and head is the name. It's a one field called head, and the type of this field is element. And elements, well, elements have a value and a pointer to the next field. So to realize a list, this would look like this. We would have some object of, of type list, and it has a field called head. And in this head, we have a pointer to the first element of the list. So this would point to an object of type element. And now these elements have two fields, a value field and a next field. So a value field and a next field. And well, for example, here we could have 
some number in there, 15, and next would be a pointer to the next list element. So this would be another list element. Let's say here we have the value 70 and the next pointer and maybe another last list element. And here the value is whatever, 36. And now it's the end of the list and so in the next field we have null. So that's the pointer uh, to nothing. So this would be the realization of the list with the numbers 15, 70, and 36. And now we want to compute the length of this list. And here we have a method length. Uh, the method gets the list as input, and then uh, it starts iterating. So it initializes a counter n, and now we have a while loop. And as long as the head of the list is not null, so as long as we really have a list element, we move uh, L dot hat to L dot hat dot next, so we move to the next list element, and we increase n by one. And we do this until we reach the end of the list, and in the end we return the value of n. Yes? So it the yes, okay. on purpose. So uh, as you notice, this is a bad algorithm, and this is meant to illustrate one of the disadvantages of imperative programming. So of course you can solve this in a more sophisticated way. Uh, so yes, this destroys the list. So let's see what happens. So in, in the beginning, n is 0, uh, l is this, l dot hat is this, it's not null, so that's fine. So we run through this while loop, we uh, move the pointer here to there, and we increase n by 1. And now we run again through this while loop, we see that l dot hat is still not null. So let's move it here, and we increase n by 1. Now uh, l dot hat is still not null. Uh, maybe we should move. Let's write it like this. So we move the pointer onwards, and we increase n by one. And now l dot hat is null. So this is the result. Okay, the result is correct. The length of the list was three, but uh, as you pointed out, this has a severe drawback because we computed the length of the list. But as a side effect, we erased the list. So in the end, l dot hat is null, so the list is lost. And well, this is most likely a programming bug. So it's, it's very unlikely that the programmer intended this. So what we can see is, well, uh, programs can have side effects. So uh, as a side effect, l is erased as a side effect. So, what, what does this mean? This means that the programmer has to think about what happens in the memory. So the programmer really has to think of something like this. Uh, he or she has to think of pointers and what happens in the memory and do side effects happen. And of course, some side effects are desired, some side effects are undesired. So that's something that the programmer has to keep in mind. So the programmer really has to think about the machine, has to consider what happens in the memory of the, of the computer. And machine-oriented details, let me call it like this. So this is a typical feature of, of imperative programming. And well, what you can also see is that an imperative program is just a sequence of instructions, and they are executed from top to bottom. And we have some control structures, like uh, this while loop, and there are other control structures, like if, then else. Uh, and these control structures, they can influence uh, the control flow of the program. So they can, they can influence in such a way that uh, execution does not only work from top to bottom, but sometimes uh, statements are executed repeatedly, or you can have branching. So that's typical for imperative programming. So statements. are executed from top to bottom, and we have certain control structures like while loops and uh, branching operations or go-to operations, or which things like this, are executed from top to bottom. And we have control structures like while loops and so on. OK, so this is probably 
what we should say about imperative programming. This is a typical imperative program. Now let's solve the same problem in a functional way. So let's program this, this algorithm again, but this time we program it in Haskell. And well, as I mentioned, the idea is to do it in a declarative way. So we only describe the problem, and then the solution has to be found by the computer. So to program this in a declarative way, so this declarative programming, well, the idea is let's just describe the problem. So what is the problem? The problem is we want to compute list length. So what we have to do is we have to define what list length means. So what, what's, what's this concept? What does it mean, list length of a list? Well, let's do this in natural language first. So we have to define what list length means. OK, so there are two cases. Either the list is empty or the list is not empty. And if the list is empty, then the length is 0. I mean, that's the definition of list length. So that's one of the things that we have to tell to the computer. So let me write this down. If the list L is empty, then the length of the list is 0. So that's one part of the definition of list length. And the second part concerns the case uh, where the list is not empty. So what happens if the list L is not empty? OK, how could one define list length uh, in this case? Well, we could do it in a recursive way. We could say, let's reduce this problem, computing the length of L, to a simpler problem, namely computing the length of the list that we get by removing the first element. So let's say the, the rest of the list, where we remove the first element, let's call this axis. So if L is not empty, and if xs is, is the list L without its first element, is the list L without the first element, Then what is the length of L? Well, what's the length of L? How would you do this in a recursive way? Yes. Right. So it's 1 plus length of excess. Right. If we knew already the length of this uh, rest list, then we can compute the length of the full list by simply increasing it by 1. OK, so that's the definition of list length. And now we can translate this natural language definition into a functional program. And the only thing that you have to know is a little bit about the syntax of the functional programming language. And of course, the syntax is different in every language. So what do we have to know about the syntax of Haskell? Well, we have to know how to write down lists. So in Haskell, we write the following. We write x colon access for the list that starts with this element x and where access is the remainder of the list. So it's the rest of the list without its first element. So this means uh, the list which results from the list access by inserting x in front from the list xs by inserting x in front. So for example, we can write down this list, 15 colon 70, 36. And this is the same as the list with the three elements, 15, 70, and 36. So colon means list insertion and list insertion in front. And you can also write down things like this. So you can write 15 colon 70 colon 36 colon empty list. So this means the empty list. And these colons are operated, are executed from right to left. So this stands for the expression where you first insert 36 into the empty list, then you insert 70 into this list, and in the end, you insert 15. So this 
is the same as the list 15, 70, 36. So colon associates to the right. So if you omit these brackets, then uh, Haskell inserts these brackets automatically. So this associates to the right. OK, so this means that every non-empty list can be written in this form. So every non-empty list in Haskell can be written in the form as x colon axis, where x means the first element and uh, axis means the rest of these elements. OK, and now we can translate these two sentences here, these two sentences in natural language. We can tr translate them to Haskell. So how would the Haskell program look like? So in the Haskell program, we would also write a function length, or len. And like in Java, this is a function that maps lists, so that maps an element L of type list to an integer. So this is the same in, in Haskell. So len is a function. And the syntax is as follows. Uh, we say, well, the type of len is a function. And this function maps lists. So for example, lists of integers to integers. So well, for integers, the only difference is that in Haskell, int is written with a capital I, and in Java, it's written with a small i. But apart from that, it's the same. And this is the data type for lists of integers. So typically, you write it like this. You write square brackets. And between these square brackets, we write the type of the elements. So this is the type of lists with uh, integer elements. So this is the type of the function len. And now, how does len work? Well, let's simply translate these two parts of the definition. Yes. Because I want to start with the simple case. And uh, I will replace this by a type variable in a minute. OK, I will do this in a minute. OK, here we have the following statement. The length of the empty list is 0. So in Haskell, this would read like this. The length of the empty list is 0. So this looks just like in mathematics. The only difference is that I didn't write round brackets around the argument. So I didn't write this. But in Haskell, you can write this. But well, Haskell programmers are lazy. They want to write as little as possible. And so whenever it's possible to omit brackets, we omit brackets. And there's no need to write brackets around the arguments. So the normal Haskell programmer would write this. But if this confuses you, you can also write brackets. So the length of the empty list is 0. And what happens if the list is not empty? Well, if L is a list that is not empty, then we can write it in the form uh, x <coughs> colon axis. So what's the length? of a list of this form, x colon axis. Well, here we have it. It's 1 plus length of axis. So it's 1 plus length of axis. And that's it. That's the Haskell program. So the step from this natural language definition to the Haskell program is rather straightforward. And well, this, this is what I meant by declarative programming. So this is very near to well, to, to the declaration of the function or to the natural language description. And therefore, this is rather easy to read and rather easy to understand. And you don't have to think about what happens in memory. This is just the definition of the length function, and that's it. So how do you now execute such a program? I mean, in, in Java, you compile the stuff, and then you call the main function. And uh, how does this work in, in Haskell? Well, in Haskell, it's, it's like in a pocket calculator. You type in some expression, and then Haskell tries to evaluate this expression. So for example, I can type in this expression, len of 15, 70, 36. 
and then I press return, and now Haskell should give me the result of this. It should try to simplify this expression, and well, to simplify this expression, Haskell uses its knowledge, and its knowledge is this. So Haskell knows this definition of length, and now it tries to simplify my expression by applying these equations. So let's do it. Um. Okay, so how can this be simplified? If I write len 15, 17, 36, well, then Haskell knows that this is just a equivalent notation for the following expression. It's 15 inserted into the list 70, 36. So every list can be written in this form. So in other words, uh, Haskell now checks from top to bottom which equation can I use to simplify this, this expression? Well, and this first equation is not helpful because this only says something about the length of empty lists. But this list is not empty. So Haskell tries the next equation. And here we see, OK, if x were 15, so if this were x, and if x's uh, were this list, so if this would be x's, then uh, this left-hand side here would match. So then we could apply the second equation and replace the left-hand side of the equation by the corresponding right-hand side. So if I replace this, then I get 1 plus len x's. And x's in our example is 70, 36. And now, of course, Haskell tries to simplify this repeatedly until it cannot go on anymore. And 70, 36, well, that can be written in the following way. This is 70 inserted into the list 36. So again, the second equation can be used here. This time, x is 70, and x is, is the list with 36. So this sub-expression can be replaced by 1 plus len x, where x is, is this list over here. So we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus len list with 36. And now the thing can be repeated again. So this is the list 36 inserted into the empty list. Now we cannot see the definition anymore. Here it is. So again, this corresponds to x. This corresponds to x's. And we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus length of the empty list. And now finally, the first equation can be used. And the length of the empty list is 0. So we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0. And plus is predefined in Haskell like in any other programming language. So Haskell can add up all these numbers and we get 3, which is what we would have expected. So what are the characteristics compared to the imperative programming up, to the imperative program up there? Yes? Well, it depends. So let, let me write down brackets, because in reality, we have this. So we had 1 plus length of this. And plus can only be executed in Haskell if both arguments are numbers. And well, this is not yet a number, so this plus I cannot execute. So I first have to evaluate this len. And now Haskell does not know that plus is associative, so that you can move these brackets over here. Well, we know this, but Haskell doesn't know this. At least I assume that Haskell doesn't know this. So brackets are like this. So we have to evaluate this, and then we have to evaluate this, and then in the end, it looks like this. So the first plus that can be executed, because both arguments are numbers, is this. So only at the very end, I can execute these pluses. Of course, there could be other algorithms where you could uh, evaluate plus earlier, but in this example, you can only evaluate at the very end. <coughs> Of course, you could think of a clever compiler that knows that plus is associative, and then you can move the brackets over here. But I don't know how the, dep this probably depends on the Haskell compiler whether it knows that plus is associative or not. But if you would do this with minus, then definitely uh, minus is not associative. OK, so what are the characteristics? Well, if we compare the Haskell program with the Java program, what do we see? There are no loops. 
So the concept of while loops does not exist. So if we want to do something repeatedly, then we have to use recursion. And that's indeed what we did up here. So length is defined recursively in order to compute length, the length of this list. We have to compute the length of the smaller list. And so the only way to have something repeatedly is, is recursion. So no loops, just recursion. Um, then something very important is we have no side effects. So this problem that we had in this Java program where we accidentally, accidentally erased the whole list, that cannot happen here. This is really a function. So it, it's a function like in mathematics. The function is applied to certain arguments and you get a result. And it doesn't matter how the memory looks before and also the memory is not changed afterwards, but if you apply len to this list, you always get the result three, always, no matter how the memory looks like before. So we have no side effects. No side effects and uh, if a function is applied to the same arguments, you always get the same result. So application of a function to the same arguments always yields the same results. To the same arguments always yields the same result. And this is called referential transparency. Referential transparency. Um, another important thing is uh, the type system, because as you already pointed out before, why do we only use this length algorithm for lists of integers? I mean, here in this Java program, I said that the values in this list are of some type data, so there's some class data. We don't know what that is. Um, in Java, we, we can do something like this. In Haskell, we can do something similar. We can say, well, it doesn't have to be lists of integers, but lists of Booleans are fine as well, because if the list consists of uh, Boolean values, length would be computed in exactly the same way. And lists of strings would also be exactly in the same way. So lists of anything are allowed. And so let's replace this int by, for example, data. And this is the type of list with elements of some type of an arbitrary type data. So now this data takes the role of a type variable and uh, you can apply this to lists of integers but also to lists of booleans or lists of strings or lists of anything. So this is the idea of the polymorphic type system. We will do this in more detail later on. I mean this is just the introduction to give you an impression what Haskell can do. So we have a polymorphic type system and well for those of you who know generic types from imperative programming languages, that's the same concept. And that was developed in functional programming and later on uh, imported to the imperative programming world. So what else do we have? Well, memory management is done automatically. So, yes. Um, and I want to refer to the second point. Yes. Um, the side effects, you mean in, in Java you have, if, if the memory is, uh, has written something on it, then you ca uh, can get wrong results. Yes. Why can't it? It can't happen here because it doesn't matter what the state of the memory is before the execution. You never access anything in the memory except uh, the arguments. So in, in, in Java, you, for example, in Java you could have global variables or in imperative programming you could have global variables and when you execute your function, you access the value of these global variables. You look into your memory and see what are the values here and, you, and your result depends on the values of these global variables in your memory. That cannot happen here. And all, so in, in that sense, the result does not depend on, uh, on the state of the memory. And also the memory is not changed. I mean, here we have this problem that the list is erased while computing the length. And something like this can never happen here. So you, you don't have to think about 
well, ideally you don't have to think about what happens in the computer. It's just this function and this function is computed and how this works, you don't have to think about it if you're not interested in efficiency. So, uh, well, it's, so sometimes you should think about it, but uh, you have to think about it much less than in imperative programming. So, we have automatic memory management. So in particular, there's no need to allocate memory or to free memory again. There's a garbage collector. Of course, this is also the case in some imperative languages. So in Java, you also don't allocate memory. You also don't uh, free it again, and there's a garbage collector. But in languages like C, uh, you have to do this yourself. So in functional languages, you don't have to do this yourself. Yes. Uh, you named the type variable data in the next yes. Isn't that a, has the keyword? No. No, you can name it uh, as you like. So very often you just call this A, small a. But I called it data to have the same name as in this Java program. So that was the only purpose. You can call it. I thought it was a Haskell keyword. No, it's not, it's not a Haskell keyword. You can call it as you like. So it's just, yeah. So int is a Haskell keyword, but data is not a Haskell. At least not at that point, Has, it's not a Haskell keyword. So what else is uh, important? Well, functions are first class citizens. So in other words, uh, functions are data objects like any other data object. And that means you cannot only write functions that take an integer and give you back an integer, but you can also take functions that take functions as arguments or that produce functions as results. So functions are just data objects like, like any other data objects. So functions are, well, let's say first class data objects. First class data objects. And what that means is, so what does this mean? This means uh, functions can Again, take functions as arguments, or they can produce functions as results. We haven't seen examples for this yet, but we will see examples later. So functions can, again, take functions as arguments or as results. Functions can take functions as arguments or results. And then uh, the last important characteristic, at least of Haskell, is the evaluation strategy. And that's a particular characteristic of Haskell. That's not true for every functional language. But Haskell has a so-called lazy evaluation strategy. And the idea is that evaluation does not start at the innermost point of an expression, but as the, at the outermost point of the expression. So you only evaluate those parts of an expression that you really need for the result. And those parts that are irrelevant for the result are not evaluated at all. So lazy evaluation, and that means only those parts of an expression are evaluated. Only those parts of expressions are evaluated that are really needed for the result are evaluated. that are really needed for the result. And that's a feature of Haskell. But not in every functional language. So for example, popular other functional languages are ML or uh, Lisp or Scheme. And in these and these functional languages, I mean, these other characteristics uh, hold more or less also for these other languages, but the evaluation strategy differs from functional language to functional language. So these are some of the most important characteristics of functional programming, in particular of Haskell. And uh, so what's, yes? Well, in other languages, functions are second class objects. So you can write functions, but it's difficult to take a function as an input. So in, in, uh, in Java, well, you can write a function or a method like this that takes a list as input. 
But if you want to write a method that takes a method as input, well, that's not so easy. So I would say in, in Java, methods are second class uh, data objects, but here they are first class. But we haven't seen examples for that yet. We will do this later on. So what's the plan in the lecture? What, what will we do? Yes. Okay, then it's a keyword for, uh, for a different purpose. Then let's, let's rename it to something else. Let's rename it to A, and then it will compile for sure. Okay, oh, let's, let's call it D. So the data, okay, now I call it D, and now I'm sure it compiles. You're right. So what's the, what's the plan for the lecture? What will we do? in this lecture. So in the, so what's our plan? Well, we will start with uh, an introduction to an actual functional, functional language, namely to Haskell. So, I mean, we, we want to do this concretely. It's not just an abstract le lecture, but we really work with a concrete functional language, and we take Haskell. So we start with an introduction to Haskell, and <coughs> So in particular, we introduced the syntax of Haskell here. And for those of you who studied in Aachen, you will know Haskell already a little bit because we did this in the first uh, year course. So this is a strict superset of what uh, has been done in the first year course. So uh, there will be some boring parts, but uh, hopefully many uh, non-boring parts. And for those of you who don't know Haskell, this will all be very uh, interesting and not, not boring. So. <laughs> So don't worry if you don't know Haskell, that's fine. And don't worry if you do know Haskell, that's also fine. So, uh, well, then, then you will know some of these things, but there will also be many things that you don't know. So in that sense, this is the, the practical part of the lecture because we really uh, have a concrete functional programming language. And then the remainder of the lecture is the more theoretical part, but we do this with a concrete language. So we do this all with Haskell. And uh, well, here we introduce the syntax of the language. So what are the constructs uh, that you can write down? What is a legal syntactic program? But a programming language has not just a syntax, but it also has a semantics. So you also have to say, what does this mean? So if you, for example, uh, write down a program like this, what does that mean? How, how does this execute? And to define this formally, one has to define the semantics of the language. In particular, this has to be fixed if you want to write a compiler. I mean, the compiler, not every compiler should do uh, what it wants, but it, they should all do the same thing. I mean, the program, the, the meaning of the program should be well-defined and it should do the same thing no matter which compiler you use or no matter which computer you run it on. And so the question is, how can one define the semantics of programming languages in a precise way? And, well, for functional languages, this is uh, rather nicely possible. This is much easier than for imperative languages. And so we will define the semantics of functional programming languages, and we do this for Haskell. So we will define the semantics of Haskell. And then the third part, we will think about how to implement functional languages. So if you really want to write an interpreter or a compiler for a functional language, how would you do this? And, well, there are several ways to do this. And what we will do is we will reduce Haskell to a subset of Haskell, to a very small subset, very easy subset, which is called the lambda calculus. And to implement this is trivial. And so our implementation works in the following way. First, Haskell programs are automatically compiled to this kind of machine language, to the lambda calculus. And then this machine program, this lambda calculus program, can be executed. So. We will look at the lambda calculus, and one purpose of this is a possible implementation of Haskell. But uh, this only executes the program. It does not type check the program. And of course, as you know from, from all typed languages, whenever you want to compile your program, the first thing that happens is the program is type checked. And well, this happens in Java, and this happens in Haskell as well. So first, uh, one checks, is this program well typed? Are functions always applied to arguments of the correct type? And of course, this can be done automatically. And how this can be done automatically, that's the topic of the 
fourth and last chapter. So this is how to do type checking automatically. And this is not entirely trivial because we have the polymorphic type system. And so how to do this automatically, we will learn there. So that's the plan for the lecture. And uh, now I hope I uh, made you interested in, in the whole thing. And uh, I will now say something about the organizational details. But before I do that, I will wipe the board. And, and then I'll tell you about the organizational stuff. OK, so something about the organization. Organization. So there's a website for the lecture. And the website is uh, the following, HTTP. Verify.rwthachen.de FP12 for Functional Programming 2012. And uh, yeah, on this website, what can you see there? All the transparencies that I put up in the lecture can be found there. So there's no need to copy these transparencies. Uh, you can download them from the website. And I will try to put them there in time before the lecture. So uh, the transparency that I put up on the, in the, the lecture should be there at least uh, the day before, so you can uh, download them and print them if you want before. Um, then the uh, exercise sheets will be there. And later on, also the solutions for the exercise sheets. Um, then the course notes. So there are course notes for this uh, course. And also the course is in English, but the course notes are in German, so there's something for everyone. So for those, <laughs> so for those of you who are uh, English speaking and not German speaking, you benefit from the course, but you can polish your German by reading the course notes and vice versa. For those of you who are German, you can uh, polish your English. Well, OK, polish. Well, you, 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 you can. Uh, you can listen to my English, which is not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you can read the German course notes. So anyway, so the course notes are in German. But of course, the programs look just the same. So uh, programs, formulas, stuff like this are pretty international. Um, yes, and uh, references and all, the, all these things can be found there, uh, details about software and so on. So, and also announcements. Uh, so announcements, that's maybe the most important thing. So dot, dot, dot. So this is the website for the course. Um, now the course is a course which comes in two versions, a bachelor version and a master version. So there are two versions of the course. And I call them V3B and V3M. V3, V means Vorlesung, lecture, 3 means 3, and B means <laughs> bachelor, and this means master. So this is the bachelor version of the course. This is the master version of the course. Uh, both of them have, on average, uh, three lecture hours per week, and they are not disjoint. Not, not at all, but they are not completely identical. So there are some parts of the lecture which are only for bachelor students and some parts which are only for master students. Only in the sense that they are, they are not secret. So I mean, the other students are welcome to attend, but they will not be part of the bachelor exam and, well, the other parts will not be part of the master exam. So the union of this thing is a V4 lecture. That's why uh, we have, two, we have uh, two times two hours per week, but that means that some lectures are not mandatory for the bachelor students and some lectures are not mandatory for the master students. Okay, so I don't write this down, so I, I hope you understood. And who attends which course? So V3B is for Bachelor Informatic, as you would have expected, and for Master Mathematics. So for some unclear reason, the master students in mathematics are uh, they attend the bachelor courses. 
I don't know why, but this is written uh, in the regulations. And the V3M course is for master informatic, master informatic, master software systems engineering, and also for bachelor informatic in case you want to take this course as, so if you, if you study bachelor computer science and you are in the last semesters of your bachelor, you can already do master exams. And so you can also decide, well, I, want to I don't want to take this course for my bachelor, I want to take this course for my master. That's fine. So this will then count for your master, but then of course you have to attend the V3M version instead of the V3B version. So these two versions are not that uh, different, but uh, well, there, there are some details which are in here and not in there and vice versa. Is there anybody studying in a program not listed here? Okay. Yeah, okay, so you can probably come to me later and we can discuss which, which version is appropriate for you. Anyway, so this is, the differences are minor, but so there will be some uh, exercises on the exercise sheets where we will say this is only for V3B students or only for V3M students. And I will also announce in the lecture which parts are just for one of these courses. And we will also write this on the website, of course. Okay, so... Um, Now, what about the exercises? So, uh, on average, there will be an exercise course every week on Wednesdays. But uh, since we had to, I mean, there were no lectures in uh, the last week and only this lecture and this week due to uh, all the holidays. And so next week, instead of the exercise course, I will do a lecture. So, so next week, uh, we will have three lectures on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So instead of exercise course, I will do lecture next week because there is not yet too much to exercise. Um, and the first exercise sheet will be distributed next Wednesday. So this will be on Wednesday, uh, April 18, and uh, and this will be so. So there will be an exception next week. We will do lecture instead of exercise, and in the week after there will also be an exception because we switch exercise and lecture. Because I am not here on Monday, but I'm here on Wednesday. So uh, this this thing will be this will be a small exercise sheet, and it will be due uh, on. On Monday, uh, April, what is this, April 23, I think. But normally, the exercise sheets will be distributed on Monday, and you will have time until Wednesday, the week after, to work on it. So you will have a little bit more than one week for the exercise sheets. So normally, normally means after that, uh, exercise sheet will be distributed on Monday, And Monday, and it will be due in the exercise course on Wednesday, Wednesday, uh, nine days after. So in the beginning, uh, we start a bit irregular, but then later on, this, this should be the idea. And these exercise sheets, uh, well, on these exercise sheets, there will be some exercises accompanying the lecture. And you should work on them and hand them in, and they will be graded. And you should reach as many points as possible. But uh, to participate in the exam in the end, to participate in the exam, uh, you should uh, reach at least 50% of the points in the exercises in the exercises. And the final exam will be a written exam. So there will be a written exam, and the exam will be on August, August 15. 
on August 15. And for those of you who failed the exam, there will be another exam in September, but I didn't look up the date. Uh, if you look into campus, you can find out, but I, I don't have it here. Okay, now uh, several people already asked me where do I have to register? Yes. So, no, exercises are every week, so it, it's like this. So, uh, let's say this is the week. Here we have Monday, then we have Wednesday, then we have Friday. These are the important days of the week because these are the dates where <laughs> you have functional programming. <laughs> and so, the idea is, uh, and it continues like this. So, here you get the exercise sheet, and then you work on it and return it here. And here you get the next exercise sheet, and you work on it, and you return it here. <laughs> so that's, that's the idea. OK? Can we implement that? Yeah, OK. So maybe we should write a program in Haskell to uh, <laughs> compute this. OK, um, okay one, one more thing, because many people ask me, where do I have to register? And OK, you have to register. So. Registration. So there are two forms of registration needed. So, I mean, there, there are three things that we do. We do have lecture, we have exercise, we have exam. So for the lecture, you don't have to re register. No registration. Just sit here and enjoy. <laughs> so no, no registration for the lecture. To participate in the exercises, you have to register because we have to put your uh, name into our database. And to do this, uh, you can register on the following website. Uh, the following website, HTTPS, so this is even secure. Uh, approve with one P only, informatic. RWTH Aachen, R -W -T -H Aachen DE, uh, FP12. So if you go to this website, uh, you will be able to register for the exams, uh, for the exercises. And please do that until next Wednesday, so that we know how many students participate here. So until Wednesday, April 18. So th this just means that we have your name in our database, and then uh, we will collect the, the points you reach in the exercises. And you can also look into uh, the database again and see how many points you've reached. And now for the exam, you have to register as well. And this registration works via campus. So uh, this is the normal registration as you do it for other exams as well. And the deadline for registering is May 18. So that's, that's the same deadline for all uh, exams. So this is nothing special. And I looked at it yesterday, and I saw that 43 persons have already registered. So uh, well, you have time until May 18 to do that. And that's, that's all. Uh, that's needed for registration, yes. That's a good question. Uh, and this, in former times, you didn't have to register, but there was the promise of the ZBA that this should be possible now as well. So uh, maybe one of you should explore. So one of, <laughs> did you? OK, so, so you are sure that this is still like this in this semester? That's how it was previously, but they promised to change it? OK, so, okay, then, uh, this is, so then this doesn't hold for the bachelor students who take the, this as a master course, and then the bachelor students who take this as a master course, they have to register with us only, so informally. But I, I, will, I will check this again. So I, I will, let, let me write this down, and I'll, I'll check it and get back to you next time. So I'll tell you next week how this works.
Okay. Okay. So, any are there any further questions concerning organization? Yes. There. Okay. Handing in the exercises, uh, you can do this in the exercise course. So, just at the beginning of the exercise course, you could do this, and there will also be a box, a wooden box. Uh, on, on our floor, so most likely beside my office, and so we're, okay, we're handing in the exercises. So handing in exercises, uh, either at the beginning of the exercise course, or a box on our floor. And the deadline will be the beginning of the exercise course because the exercises are presented in the exercise course. So afterwards you know the solutions, then it makes no point anymore. And in fact, since there are so many people in this lecture, uh, we are still looking for someone who helps us with grading the exercises. So even if you're attending the course, that is still possible that you grade the exercises simultaneously. We have ways of organizing this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that doesn't mean that you, ha you don't have to do this yourself, but, but we, well, we have some experience in doing this. We did that before. So if you're, if you're interested in earning some money and uh, in getting some money for solving these exercises and grading exercises, then please uh, let us know because uh, there are so many people here. It would be good to have some more students grading. Yes, you have to do the exercises in groups. And how large these groups are depends on how many people we have for grading. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely uh, doing this alone, there's no way that we can grade all these exercises because we don't have enough students to, to do this. So, uh, so wanted. <laughs> students. Uh, Grading exercises. And this has something to do with money, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to do this for free. Okay, so think about it and uh, let us know if you're interested. Okay, further questions? Okay, no further questions. So we can start with the real content of the lecture. So then let's start with chapter one. And chapter one is the introduction to Haskell. Okay, so uh, since we really write programs in Haskell, uh, you should really run them. So this is not pure theory. So we. So you should really test your programs, run your programs, so you should install Haskell on your favorite computer. And uh, to install Haskell, the best thing is to visit the Haskell homepage. And the Haskell homepage is www.haskell.org. And uh, on this website, you will find lots of information about Haskell. In particular, you will find implementations of Haskell. And um, we recommend to download the GHC, which stands for the Glasgow Haskell Compiler, because this was developed in Glasgow. And so you can download this from this website. and. Uh, you can find this for Windows, Mac, and Linux, so for all major operating systems. And for the lecture, so for, for didactical purposes, we use GHCI, and this small i means this is the interactive mode of the Glasgow Haskell compiler. And in particular, you can use this also as an interpreter. So this i means it's the so-called interactive mode. And you can use this as an interpreter for Haskell. So that's the implementation of Haskell that we uh, recommend. But you can use any implementation of Haskell, but that's the most standard one nowadays. So um, what's the plan for this chapter? Well, in 
section 1.1, one, one, I will introduce the, syn the syntax of Haskell. So the major constructs of Haskell, we will not introduce everything, but, uh, well, 80% of Haskell. So this is, we introduce the syntax and constructs of Haskell. And then once we know what Haskell is, uh, in the remaining subsections 1, 2 to, to 1, 4, we will discuss typical programming techniques in functional languages. So I mean many programming techniques that you know from, imper from imperative programming you can also use for functional programming, but there are some specific things. So here we will focus on those things that you can do in functional languages and you cannot easily do in imperative languages. So yeah, functional programming techniques. Okay, so this is the plan. Okay, and before we start, I again have to wipe boards a bit. Okay, so let's look at the syntax and the constructs of Haskell. And well, essentially there are four main constructs in Haskell. Namely, declarations, declarations, expressions, patterns, and types. So these are the four main constructs in Haskell, and we will introduce them one after another. So let's start with declarations. So essentially, a Haskell program is just a sequence of declarations. So a Haskell program is a sequence of declarations. And for a certain reason, these declarations all, I mean, you write these declarations in rows, and these rows have to start at the same position. So it looks like this. This is the first row, and the second row looks like this. And the next row does not look like this, and it does not like, look like this, but it starts at exactly the same point. So they really have to, be, have to start at the same position. That looks awkward, and there's a certain reason for that that we will uh, learn after another, uh, afterwards. So, so starting at the same uh, position. So the layout of the program plays a role in Haskell. So that's, that's awkward, but uh, that turns out to be quite handy afterwards. And what, what does a declaration do? A declaration describes a function. So the idea is that a declaration describes a function and there are two kinds of declarations, namely type declarations and function declarations. And to introduce the syntax of Haskell formally, I will do this via a context-free grammar and I will extend this more and more. So the first Grammar rule is this. So we introduce the syntax of Haskell by appropriate context-free grammars. The syntax of Haskell by uh, a grammar and the non-terminals in this grammar are underlined. So in this way you can distinguish non-terminals from terminals so uh, if you know nothing about grammars, don't worry. Um, the underlined things, these are things that are just auxiliary symbols. They don't occur in the program. So you don't write decal in your program or type decal. This is just something to, uh, to construct the programs. But uh, later on, there will be some keywords that you really write into your programs. For example, this colon colon you write in your program or int. So these things really occur in your program, but decal or type decal you don't write by grammar. 
So the non-terminals are underlined here. So if you want to have a declaration, then it's either a type declaration or a function declaration. So there are two kinds of declarations. So let's first look at type declarations. Um, type declarations and, functions declara and function declarations. And uh, oh, before I forget, uh, comments. So uh, apart from declarations, ASCII program can have comments like in any other programming language, and comments are important as in any other programming language. But the syntax for comments differs from language to language. So before I forget that, I, I will mention this. So comments in Haskell, you can either write a curly bracket dash, and then everything which comes after that is a comment until you reach dash curly bracket. So if you want to have long comments which go over several lines, you can use this. And if you have a short comment which fits in one row, you can write dash dash, and then everything until the uh, end of line. Everything in here is a comment. So that's, that's similar to other programming languages, but the syntax is, is a little different, but that's it. So let's go back to the declarations. What are type declarations? OK, here's an example for a type declaration. For example, I might want to define a function called square. And the idea is that square should take a number and square it. So square applied to 3 should give me the number 9, 3 times 3. So the type declaration tells me what is the type of this function. And they look like this. They start with the name of the function. Then we have this double colon. And then we have the type of the function. So in this case, this would be a function from int to int takes an integer number and returns an integer number. So it's a function from int to int. So this would be an example for uh, a type declaration. So in general, what's the syntax for type declarations? The syntax for type declarations look like, looks like this. So. A type declaration, type declaration has the following form. Uh, you start with the name of a function. And for names of functions, we use the same syntax as for variables. So a function name is simply a variable. Uh, and then comes this double colon, and then comes a type. And you can, in one single type declaration, you can declare several functions of the same type. So you could also say, well, square. I want to de declare square and double simultaneously, both square and double are functions of type int to int. So something like this would also be possible. So if the functions have the same type, you can do it in one single type declaration. And so what's the meaning? Well, this means this is the domain of the function. So this is the domain type of the function, and this is the range type. And how types are constructed, we will uh, define formally later on. But you can already see uh, how this works. So what types do we have? Well, we have types like int for the type of uh, integer numbers. We have also types like this, int arrow int. This is also a type on its own, because this is the type of functions from int to int. type of functions from int to int. And so you can already see that if you have a type, you can construct new types by writing an arrow between two already existing types. There are also some more of these base types. So there's also something like bool or double or well, all the standard basic types that you have in other languages, uh, you have here as well. Character. So all the stuff you have also here. And uh, 
you can construct new types by writing an arrow between two already existing types, and you can construct new types by writing square brackets around the types. So this would be the type of lists with integer elements with integer elements and well many other types are possible for example you could write a type like this now what would this be this would be the type of functions that take a list with integers as input and return an integer so for example uh, a maximum function might have this type it takes a list of integers and gives you back uh, the maximal element of the list. Or you can write, um, you can also write something like this. What, what type is this? Mm -hmm. It's a list of list of integers. Right. You can also write awkward things like this. What's this? Mm-hmm. It's a list of functions, and all the functions go from int to int. So for example, this could be the list uh, containing square and double. I mean, square goes from int to int, double goes from int to int. So this list containing square and double would have this type. So this gives you some ideas of types. There are other possibilities, but uh, just to, to show you how types can look like. And type declaration says we have a function or a variable which has a certain type. This is uh, what is declared here. Now these type declarations, they don't have to be written by the programmer. If the programmer doesn't write them, then Haskell infers them automatically. So type declarations don't have to be written by the programmer. by the programmer, and if the programmer doesn't write them, then, then Haskell infers them automatically. How Haskell does that, we will learn later on in chapter four. Then Haskell infers them automatically. But if the programmer writes them, then Haskell checks whether the function really has this type. So if your type declaration does not correspond to the definition of the function, then, well, then the Haskell compiler will notice and uh, it will complain. So, but it's good programming style to write type declarations. But, uh, so good programming style is write the type declarations yourself, because then uh, you can express what you think the type of this function is, and if this does not work, then Haskell will already know when compiling. So write type, dec type declarations in your program. And uh, finally, to, to make the syntax clear here, these variable names, so this var1 to var n, these are the names of functions or of variables. And in Haskell, you can use as, as names for variables or functions, you can use strings, but the strings have to start with a lowercase symbol. So, so variable names are strings starting with a lowercase symbol. So, as you noticed, uh, square and double here start with lowercase letters. OK, so these are, uh, these are type declarations. What are function declarations? Well, the function declarations now really uh, describe what the function does, how the function is defined. And an example, let's do it again with, with square. An example would be something like this. Square of x equals x times x. So this describes what square should do. This is the definition of square. So what is the grammar rule for function declarations? OK, here I also wrote it down. Variables are strings starting with lowercase symbol. And a function declaration consists of a 
function left-hand side, LHS, and a function right-hand side. And in our example, the function left-hand side is this, and the function right-hand side is this. So what's the grammar rule for left-hand sides and right-hand sides? Well, the grammar rule is the following. The left-hand side consists of a variable, that's the name of the function, and a pattern. And this pattern describes the form of the expected argument. So in our example, this thing is the variable. So this is the name of the function. And this thing describes the expected argument. So this describes that here we expect an arbitrary argument, an arbitrary argument x. So a pattern is a, a special expression describing the forms of expected arguments. Describing uh, expected arguments. Again, the formal uh, definition of patterns will come afterwards, but uh, at the moment you can think of patterns as uh, something like variables. So a variable describes that any argument is allowed here. So square can be applied to any argument, and then the right-hand side is, starts with an equality sign and then an expression. So this thing here is an arbitrary expression. And, well, how expressions look like we will see uh, very soon. And one possibility is something like this. So you take two variables and you apply a function to them. And this uh, star is a function that is predefined and it computes multiplication as you would have uh, expected. So basic operations in Haskell are predefined. Are predefined in Haskell. So what are basic operations that are predefined, well, arithmetic basic operations like plus, minus, multiplication, and uh, well, division is also predefined, and modulo is defined, and so on. So these are basic arithmetic operations. Then uh, comparison operators are also predefined. So for example, something like this. This checks whether two uh, values are equal, and uh, something like greater or greater equal. So these things are predefined as well. So comparison operators are predefined. And Boolean operators are also predefined. So something like not or and or or. So these things are predefined as well. So this syntax is like in C or Java, except that uh, not is not exclamation mark, but not. But the syntax for and and or is the same. And the syntax here is the same, and the syntax here is the same as well. So nothing new. I mean, this is predefined like in, like in imperative languages. Nothing special. We have basic operations. OK, so this is uh, the syntax of function declarations. And now, if I have a program like this, so this is the square program with uh, the type declaration up there and the function declaration down here. How can I execute it? Well, we had this already. We write down an expression, and then this expression is evaluated. So let's discuss this a bit more. OK, so uh, the execution of a functional program. What's, what's the general idea? So let's execute our square program that uh, I just wiped away. So I, I'll write it down again so that we can see it. So we had the square program. And square is a function from int to int. This was the type declaration. And the function declaration was the following. Square of x equals x times x. And now how does evaluation work? Well, the idea is that uh, in the Haskell interpreter, you type in expressions, you press return. And then Haskell tries to evaluate this expression. And the idea for evaluating this is term rewriting. 
evaluation by term rewriting in German term ersetzung. So this is the evaluation mechanism that is used. And uh, it works as follows. In the first step, well, you have an expression that you want to evaluate. And in the first step, uh, Haskell tries to find some subpart of this expression such that the left hand side of an equation matches this sub expression. So the first part is find a sub expression of the expression that we want to evaluate such that such that a left hand side LHS, a left hand side of a defining equation matches the sub expressions. matches uh, the sub-expression. What does matches mean? So matching means we instantiate the variables in this left-hand side in such a way that uh, this instantiated left-hand side becomes equal to the sub-expression. So instantiate the variables in uh, the defining equation. And once we have found such a defining equation where the left-hand side matches the sub-expression, the second step is to replace the left-hand side by the right-hand side. Replace the sub-expression by the corresponding instantiated right-hand side. I will do this by an example in a minute, by the corresponding instantiated right-hand side. OK, so let's look at an expression, square of 12 minus 1. If I want to evaluate this, now there are two principal possibilities. Uh, I can try to evaluate the square here, and I have an equation which tells me how square is defined. I could also try to evaluate this minus, because minus is predefined. So there are equations for minus built into Haskell, and uh, these equations would allow me to compute something like 12 minus 1. It would find out that the result of this is 11. So two possibilities. Uh, what should we evaluate? Should we start with evaluating square or should we start with evaluating minus? Let's start with evaluating minus. If I evaluate minus, then uh, I evaluate this sub-expression. So this is the sub-expression which is evaluated and I get square of 11. Now I can continue the evaluation and I follow these two steps. So I look for a defining equation such that the left-hand side of this defining equation matches some sub-expression here. So I find this, and now the question is, can I instantiate the variable here in such a way that it becomes equal to this expression here? Yes, of course, I can instantiate x by 11. Then I have square 11 here, and therefore I can replace this instantiated left-hand side by the corresponding instantiated right-hand side. So x is instantiated by 11, and so I get 11 times 11. And now uh, evaluation can continue, and I get 121. But of course, I could have done this uh, differently. Well, I could have started with evaluating square, and then I would get other possibilities for evaluation. And in the next lecture, we will discuss about these other possibilities, and we will find out what Haskell actually does, so in which order things are evaluated. OK, and we continue with this on Monday. So. Uh, See you again next week on Monday.